infection, tumors and fractures. Of course, the most important, first of all, is anatomy. What you must know about the orbit? Orbit actually is bony cavities. And in these bony cavities, we have globes, extraocular muscles. How many extraocular muscles we have? Six. Six. Four rectus and two oblipus. Except this, we have also nerves, fat and blood vessels. And the orbit is in pyramidal or conical in shape, consists of an apex, base, and four sides, roof, floor, medial wall, and lateral wall. The orbit is built from seven bones, frontal, zygomatic, maxillary, sphenoid, ethmoid, lacrimal, and palatinum. And this is schematical picture of the orbit. We're going to start with the roof of the orbit. Roof of the orbit is built from frontal bone and lesser wing of the sphenoid. It's located at just the anterior cranial fossa and frontal sinus. Then we have lateral wall of the orbit. Lateral wall of the orbit is built from zygomatic bone and greater wing of the sphenoid. Here you see the roof of the orbit. Medial wall, actually, it's the most thinnest wall in the orbit. It's built from ethmoid, lacrimal, maxillary, and sphenoid bones. Forms, actually, the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. And the most important here that this medial wall is the thinnest wall in the orbit. Then we have floor of the orbit, and the floor is built from maxillary, palatine, and zygomatic bones. This is medial wall. I told you the thinnest wall in the orbit. What else we have in the orbit? We have orbital apertures. First of all, the most important is optic canal. Through the optic canal, going optic nerve, ophthalmic artery, and sympathetic nerves. Then we have fissura orbitalis superior and fissura orbitalis inferior. Through, through fissura orbitalis superior going cranial nerve 3, 4, 5 and 6 and some sympathetic nerves. And through fissura orbitalis inferior going cranial nerve 5, clone 2. Next step, first was the anatomy, and then I told you that we're going to speak about the clinical evaluation in the orbital disease. It's very easy to remember these six P's. What mean this? If we have some orbital disease, we have pain, we have proptosis, we have progression, palpation, pulsation, and some periorbital changes. I think it's very easy to remember these six P's. First, we're going to speak about the proptosis. Proptosis, first of all, could be unilateral or bilateral proptosis. When the, unilateral, when the proptosis is unilateral, it could be also axial displacement and non-axial displacement. In which cases we have axial displacement? In case in retrobulbar lesion like cavernous hemangioma, glioma, meningioma, arteriovenomal lesion in the muscle cone. In which cases we have non-axial displacement? Non-axial displacement we have in this case that we have outside the process, it's outside of the muscle cone. And we can have superior displacement, inferomedial displacement. We have superior displacement when we have maxilla tumor in the floor of the orbit. And second case, we to have inferomedial displacement, we have this displacement when we have some dermoid cyst and lacrimal gland tumor. Do you understand me? Yep. Yes. Okay. And I told you that the second case is to have non-unilateral 
unilateral proptosis. And the most important and um, the most um, a common cause of bilateral proptosis is actually graves of town patine. Next P was progression. Progression in the orbital disease could be slow and could be fast. And fast progression means days to weeks. Slow progression means months to years. In which cases we can have days to weeks progression. Of course, in inflammatory disease, infection disease, or in some cases of metastatic tumors. Slow progression we have in benign mixed tumors, in lymphomas, and dermoids cyst. Next P was palpation. In some orbital disease, we can have supranasal or superotemporal palpation. Supranasal we have in Uncucellus or nevofibromatous dermoids. Superotemporal palpation we can have in case of lacrimal gland tumor or pseudotumor. Next P was pulsation. Pulsation could be with bruit or without bruit. In the first case, this is when we have cystocavernous fistula. Second case, this is meningoencephal cell. Next point, it's diagnostic modalities in the orbital disease. We can separate these diagnostic modalities of two parts, primary studies and secondary studies. Primary studies, this is the most important studies that we make in the patient that have some orbital disease. This is computer tomography, MRI, ultrasonography on and histopathology. Secondary studies, this is more specific studies. It's uh, not uh, usually, it's not so common to use them and to make them in the patient with orbital disease, but in some cases we need to perform them. It's venography and arteriography. Professor, is there any yes. preference between CT or MRI for clinical for evaluation of the orbital diseases? Sorry, I can't hear you very good. One more time. Is there any preference between CT or MRI? Yes, of course. Next slide. Can you see ah, the next sorry, slide? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Now we can speak. We gonna speak about the advantages and disadvantages, and when we use CT and when we use MRI. First of all, the most important thing, of course, in Bulgaria, and I, I don't know where you're from, but in Bulgaria, the most important thing is price, of course. Prices, disadvantages from MRI. Uh, in which cases it's good, but computer tomography. Computer tomography is good for most orbital conditions, especially for fractures. It gives us a good view of bone, of course, less soft tissue detail. For the soft tissue detail, we can use MRI. Degraded image of orbital apex due to the bony artifact. This is also disadvantage. It's good, computer tomography, it's good for metallic foreign body. The most important thing is that it's less expensive and it's shorter, gives us shorter scanning time. MRI is more expensive, it's um, needed longer scanning time, it's contraindicated for metallic frame body, but it's very good, give us very good view of the orbital apex, give us very more soft tissue details, and it's better for orbitocranial lesions. But for fractures, it's better CT scan. Okay, this is enough for you? Yes, Professor, thank you. This is the most important, of course. There is many, many disadvantages and advantages, but this is most important. Next point. I told you that we're going to speak about these graves of thalmopathy or theory toxicosis. This is very common autoimmune disorder that it's related to excess secretion of steroid hormone. In many cases, 10 
95%, but this disease occurs in the absence of any thyroid dysfunction. This is strange, but it's true. Females are more affected of grace of downpathy, and uh, this common in 40 to 50 decades of life, very common in the female. Most common cause of adult unilateral or bilateral proptosis. It's grave sultanopathy. About the pathogenesis, um, this is actually hypertrophy of extraocular muscles, is um, cellular infiltration and proliferation of orbital fat connective tissue. This is, that's the way the eye bulb going out, not because the eye bulb going bigger and because of this hypertrophy and about this cellular infiltration of the orbital tissue. Main clinical manifestation, of course, um, that affected ophthalmology, it's eyelid retraction, soft tissue involvement, proptosis, unilateral or bilateral optic nephropathy and restrictive myopathy. And um, I think uh, you see very often picture like this. This is woman on the first picture. You, go, you can see this eyelid retraction. And um, most affected are women. You can see of the next picture that there is um, bilateral proptosis that um, it's, um, in the first case, left eye, it's more affected than the right eye. In the second picture, you can see the woman with bilateral proptosis. This soft tissue involvement, um, it's very, um, uh, it's uh, very uh, affected for the patient. You can see this conjunctival injection of the conjunctiva, you can see this humosis. What mean humosis of the conjunctiva? Do you know? Humosis mean edema of the conjunctiva. You see on the picture down this edema, this humosis of the conjunctiva, and this eyelid fullness. And this is very deep, ugly picture. You see this proptosis in the left eye, also this hemosis of the conjunctiva and inaction of the conjunctiva. Do you see good the picture? Yes, yes. Okay. And this is restricted myopathy. What mean this? We told, um, uh, you told me that we have six muscles and these six muscles, they're different affected from the graves of town, but it, the most affected muscles actually it's rectus inferior, then rectus medialis, then rectus superior, and then rectus lateralis. The most affected muscles in graves of tamopathy, they are rectus muscles, not obliquus, rectus muscles. This is one CT scan, and on this CT scan, it's very good to see this hypertrophy with tendon sparring of the extraocular muscles. What key points in this disease? We, you must remember that eyelid retraction is the most common clinical features. Graves of tomopathy is the most common cause of eyelid retraction. Graves of tomopathy is also the most common cause of unilateral or bilateral proptosis. It's six more times more common in female than in male in 4 to 50 decades. And this condition is associated with hyperthyroidism in 90% of cases. But we have 10, even 20% of cases. In these cases, we don't have hyperthyroidism. Severity of ophthalmopathy may not parallel due to the serum levels of T3 and T4. This is very important. And to tampody may be asymmetric. Urgent care may be required for optic nephropathy or severe proptosis. And if surgery is needed, the usual order of surgery is decompression. But it's not for ophthalmology, it's make it surgeon. 
it's other part of surgeon. It's not make it from ophthalmology from us, from ophthalmology surgeon. Okay, we're going to the next step about the orbital infection. We're going to speak about Sorry, the orbital Professor. Yes. Um, can yes. I just ask a question regarding yeah. the Graves' disease? Yes. Firstly, um, why is it more common in females? <laughs> Never knows. Maybe about the hormones, but um, nobody knows. It's more common in the women's, but nobody knows why. Because of the women hormones and because of uh, a high level of T3 and T4 in the women, nobody knows. Nobody knows even why. In 10 to 20 percent, I told you, in cases, we don't have hyperthyrotoxicosis. Okay, thank you. And then also, um, so it's mainly due to the increased T3 and T4, right? Yeah. So um, when they want to treat it, yeah. do they just control these hormones and then the eye automatically um, goes back to its normal location? Oh, how, does, no, how does the treatment no, work? In all cases, and you can see the first point here that the severity of ophthalmopathy may not be parallel to the serum, to the level serum of T3 and T4. It could be T3 and T4 in very good level, but except this, we can have very uh, visible ophthalmopathy in this patient with Graves' ophthalm disease. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't hear you very good. I don't know why and from where I can make the level of the sign. But okay, do you hear me good? Because I, do, I hear you very slow, very not very good. Yes, I hear you very well. Maybe it's just oh. my a problem from my side. I don't know. Why. Okay. Okay, it's enough. We can talk about the infection of the orbital. Yes, thank you. Yes. Next step is infection. I told you that in the orbital we have fat tissue, we have vessels, we have nerves, we have extra ocular muscles, we have many, many other points of um, um, that can be infected. Um, the most important here is to uh, separate the infection of the orbital of preceptal and septal cellulitis. Cellulitis is the name of infection of the fat tissue in the orbit. In patients with preceptal cellulitis, infection look up, you see that the left eye is not moving. Do you have a question about the differential diagnosis from these two diseases? It's not it's not the uh, first diseases. This is secondary diseases from sinusitis, from some other bacterial infection through the eye book to the nose. This is secondary infection. Is the papillary reaction affected in the orbital cellulitis? Is the what? Is the, oh, the papillary reaction uh, affected yes, in orbital cellulitis? Yes, there cellulitis? is. There is, but the most important here is when we have preceptal cellulitis, it's the treatment, it's only local treatment, but when in cases when we have orbital cellulitis or postseptal cellulitis, then the treatment must be also with antibiotic appearance because we have also fever, we can have other things that affected the uh, stomatic patient of the patient. It's more serious orbital infection and orbital cellulitis. Then we have orbital tumors. We can have vascular tumors, tumor of the lacrimal gland, rhabdomyosarcoma, cystic lesion, nephrotumor, tumor, metastatic, metastatic or tumor invasion from the adjustment structures, for example, from the sinus. We're going to start with the most common tumor in the orbit, in the tooth health, and this is capillary hemangioma. This tumor increases 
in size during crying and straining, it's absent buric and pulsation, it's typical for this tumor, and this tumor in the most big part, in the most common part of the patient, involute spontaneously. It's not needed to treat them. The most common benignant orbital lesion in adults is cavernous hemangioma. Also women are affected, but if you ask me why, I don't know why. Middle-aged woman is commonly affected and has well encapsulated mass of CT scan. The prognosis is very good and the therapy is surgical excision. Then most common primary but very malignant tumor in the child called its ratomyl sarcoma. Age onset is seven to eight years old. This tumor has rapid onset of proptosis. The prognosis is not very good and it's serious. The prognosis is serious in these cases. And we treated this patient with exenteration, radiotherapy, and combination with radiotherapy and chemo. What is exenteration? Exenteration is operation surgical of eye poop and estrochal muscles. Everything, operation of everything, tissue of the orbit. I poop, extraocular muscles, fat tissue, vessels, everything from the orbit. This is exenteration. It's left only the orbit. So okay. do we remove everything? What? No, we remove everything with this surgery. We remove everything. Enucleation, and it's when we remove only the I poop. Exenteration, it's when we remove everything from the orbit. It's left only the orbit, and in these cases, we need artificial eye. Okay? Thank you. Most common epithelial tumor of the lacrimal gland is pleomorphic adenoma. Here, the most affected are mains, fourth through fifth decades of life. It's progressive, it's painless, downward and inward displacement. In these cases, we can have downward or inward displacement. This is one dermoid cyst. It's benign tumor. It's well encapsulated, lined by stratified squamous and contain dermal appendages. Epidermoid does not contain dermal appendages. It's benign tumor and we remove them surgical. What is this? Okay, next step is when uh, I told you that we're going to speak about the fractures of the orbit, and now I have a question to you. Which was the most thinnest part of the orbit? The most thinnest wall? The media. The media wall, yes. But the, fruit, the fractures of the orbit is most common of the orbital floor. Why? Because here we have space, more space to the fractures. The orbital floor is connected to the sinus. And that's the way we have more space here. This is most frequently involved wall and usually along the infraorbital canal. It's based these fractures. And to it was the clinical features of the fractures. We can have periocular changes like ecchymosis, oedema, subcutaneous emphysema. In these cases, we have not exophthalmos, we have anophthalmos. We can have anophthalmos. We have infraorbital nerve anesthesia. And we can have diplopia. What is diplopia? Seeing double. What? Double vision doubles. is diplopia. Do you understand me? Double yes. vision is diplopia. Yes, yes. yes. Oh. Okay. And this is patient with fractures of the orbit. 
Uh, it's very typical one sign. I don't know where you're from. Is there people from Germany, for example? No? No students from Germany. Okay, we call this, we call this Bile hematoma. It means eye, eyeglass hematoma. It's very typical for these fractures of the orbit. Also, one other picture of this Bile hematoma. And how we treated fractures of the orbit? It's not our job. It's not not we not it's not ophthalmologists treated this fractures of the orbit. In the most of the cases, it's not surgical surgical treatment. It's only uh, repukui and like this. Okay. Next step is lacrimal system. What we know must to know about the lacrimal system, first of course, it's anatomy and physiology. Then we're going to speak about the epiphora and lacrimation. Then we're going to go through a clinical evaluation of curing, infection of the lacrimal passage, treatment of lacrimal obstruction, and some surgical techniques about the treatment in the lacrimal system. First, I want to remember one thing. We have tears in the eye, not only when we cry. We have tears in the eye. 24 hours. And the anatomy of this tear flow, this is, you must remember very good this anatomy of tear flow physiology. First of all, tears coming this punctil lacrimalis, then truth canaliculi lacrimalis, it's going to sacrus lacrimalis, and then ductus nasal lacrimalis. Do you want to remember? To repeat this, puncti lacrimalis, canaliculi lacrimalis, sacrus lacrimalis, and ductus nasal lacrimalis. This is actually tear flow physiology. So, we have two very important things. This is first is lacrimation, then is epiphora. It means, in both things, it means tearing but other part of tearing, other conception of tearing. Lacrimation actually is a reflex of overproduction of tears. When we have stimulation, by irritation of the cornea or conjunctiva. In case that we before, we have also tearing, but in this tearing, we have normal tear production, but there is no physical, physiological of physical obstruction in the drainage system. Do you understand the difference between these two things, two tearing, two parts of tearing, lacrimation and epiphora? So, when we speak about the tear film, we have two parts of disorders. We have dry disorders and wet time. We can have also drainage obstruction, lacrimal gland inflammation, tumor of the lacrimal gland, and tumor of the lacrimal sac. The most important disease that affected young people, they said, um, um, in this uh, online education, for example, very typical, this is keratoconjunctivitis sicca. This is aqueous fast deficiency, and um, maybe when, first of all, when we speak about the tears, we must to know that the tear film has three phases. First of all, it's mucin, then it's aqueous fast, and then it's lipid fast. Actually, in keratoconjunctivitis sicca, we have deficiency in the aqueous fast of tear film, and the most important symptoms are redness in the eye, burning sensation, gritty sensation, in, in some cases, we can have epiphora. We have, um, this is not so, not for you, it's... If, we, if you were here in the clinic, we can show you this um, test. It, we call this as Schirmer test. And Schirmer test shows us the quantity and the quality of the tear film. But unfortunately, you at home, and now this is 
unbelievable. This this is Sika syndrome and this Sika tears of the eye. You see here one dry eye and keratoconjunctivitis Sika, very typical picture of this. When we have Mucin deficiency, Mucin is actually the first layer of the tear film. We can have tear breakup time, it's less. We can have these bit of spots and the most common cause of this is vitamin A deficiency. This, is, this disease is rare disease and um, in uh, this disease we can have in patients with trachomatis, with pemphiguit, with some chemical burns. In these cases we can have mucin deficiency of the tear film. You see this picture of this tear keyboard bro. And the other layer of the tear film it's oily layer. Oily layer of abdominalitis could be from mebuimitis, blepharitis. Do you know what is blepharitis? Do you speak about the blepharitis with Professor Dimitrov, I think? Or no, or still no? Information of the island. What? One we, haven't spoken of, we have not spoken about it yet, but it's inflammation of the eyelids. It's inflammation of the eyelid, yes. Blepharitis and mebuimitis, this is gland in the eyelids that produce this oily layer of the tear film. And in these cases, we can have this oily layer of normalities. You see, do you see this little spot? This is actually mebumi glands. And in these cases, we have blepharitis, inflammation of the eyelid, and inflammation of this mebumi gland. And in these cases, we have the sufficiency of the layer film of the tear film. This is also inflammation of the eyelid with mebuimi. How we can manage this dry eye disease? We can put artificial tears first. We can make it lit toilet and compress with occasional use of topical antibiotics. We can use mucolytics for filamentary keratitis. We can use vitamin A when we have a sufficiency of, uh, in the vitamin A. We, we can put punctal plaques that affect the tearing also. We have, we can stop exaboration medication and in some cases we can perform surgery to the lid when we have some deformities of the lid eye. In which cases we have, we have epiphora. Epiphora was tearing but when we have normal tear production, we can in this in which cases we can have epiphora. In the most common part, it's when we have lacrimal drainage system obstruction. This is the most important cause of epiphora. In these patients, we can exclude also dry eye. We must check punctal position and patency, and we must apply lacrimal sac pressure looking for reflux from mucocele. Or we must test lacrimal drainage patency. We can use in the clinic some specific test of the patency of the lacrimal system, fluorescent test, Jones test, surrounding and probing, and uh, in some cases, we can use also CT or MRI scan for the C of the drainage system in the eye. And which causes are very typical for this obstruction in the lacrimal drainage system? The most common causes are congenital, but we can have also acquired causes. For congenital causes, the most important and the most obvious is absence or atresia of the canaliculi or puncta, incomplete opening of the ductus nasolacrimalis, or they could be associated with other craniofacial facial abnormalities. In cases of acquired 
drainage system obstruction. The most important is senile. In the adult people, it's very typical punctal stenosis. Our punctal stenosis could be associated also with chronic infection. Or for the adult people, it's very typical lead eye position, misposition of the lead eye, ectropion or intropion with some conjunctival cicatrization. Other causes of the drainage system obstruction, acquired causes could be trauma, inflammation, could be drug induced, and some infection. Uh, very typical is um, this uh, obstruction of ductus nasolacrimalis in the children. Um, when the children is in the mother D, we have this casnary membrane to the end of ductus lacrimalis. And uh, when the newborn is um, one, two, three weeks, this casnary membrane must be decreased. And in these cases, we have ductus nasolacrimalis that it's obstructed from this casnary membrane. In these cases, we have epiphora. And uh, this is very typical tearing in the children. What we perform in these children, uh, until six months, we can use um, some massage on some antibiotic eye drops. But if this doesn't help, we must um, make it so uh, uh, we, we must perform sonda to the this obstruction of the children. How we treat this drainage system obstruction? Treatment depends, of course, on the site of obstruction and falls into the ophthalmologist realm. Puncti may be dilated, lit malposition must be corrected, recanalization operation must be performed, treat infection causes like canaculitis, dactylocystitis must be treated, and um, Recurrent dactylocystitis required DCR. You see this punctilacrimalis obstruction. At this point, we must destroy this obstruction of the punctilacrimalis. Uh, very uh, often, inflammation in the adult people is canaliculitis or inflammation of, the, of this canaliculi lacrimalis. Um, you see on this patient this redness and conjunctival inaction of the left, left eye. This is very typical canaliculitis. In these cases, we have unilateral epiphora with mucopolene discharge, putting of punctum on slit lamp exam. It's typical for the adult people. For the lacrimal gland, we have some very, uh, very important inflammations, and uh, we're going to speak about them, and then we're going to speak about the lacrimal gland tumor. Very typical are the viral dacryodinitis, acute bacterial dacryodinitis, they're secondary due to conjunctivitis, this is secondary infection, chronic bacterial, for example, like tuberculosis and syphilis. Uh, and some inflammatory condition, for example, like Sugren syndrome, sarcoidosis, and Wegener syndrome. Could be also reactive lymphoid hyperplasia and lymphoma. This is inflammation of Saxus lacrimalis. You see on the left eye, here is Saxus lacrimalis, and this is inflammation of the whole sac. We call this inflammation dacryocystitis. Dacryocystitis is infection of the lacrimal sac, presents as painful swelling in the medial counter area. Next, it's tumor of the lacrimal gland. 50% are inflammation and lymphoid proliferation. Pleomorphic adenoma is one benign mixed cell tumors. It's 20 to 60 years old. It's affected people 20 to 60 years old. It's painless, usually with lung history. It's palpable heart nodular mass. 
in this in this patient we have non-axial proptosis, we have extramedial proptosis, and the treatment is surgical removal. We have good prognosis. In patients with carcinoma, carcinoma actually it's the the tumor, it's malignant tumor in the gland, malignant gland tumors. We have in this patient poor prognosis, it's epithelial region, in a region it's painful, usually with shorter history than the benign tumor, causes local bony erosion, it's usually biopsied after trial of antibiotics, and um, in, this case, in this patient we treat it with surgical and then with uh, radio and chemotherapy, but prognosis is not good. And also we have tumor of the lacrimal sac. Uh, these tumors are rare, painless swelling, punctal reflux of pus and blood, and could be, in the most of the cases, could be adenocarcinoma. You see in this patient, this in this old patient, adenocarcinoma of the sacrus lacrimalis. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have some questions to me? Yes, Professor. Yes. What exactly yes. is the clear breakup time? What? What exactly is the clear breakup time? The breakup time is the time that when we blink and then we open the eye, the tear film stays stable. Okay? And when we are testing it, what exactly if, are we looking for? So, a pathology in the tear breakup time would be indicated to what? breakup time, we test it in patients with dry eye disease. If the patient has some tear burning, redness, some burning in the eye, we must test this tear breakup time and we must discuss in this patient if the tear film is stable. Because not only the quality of the tears is enough, it's also the quantity of the tear film must be stable. And the quantity of the tear film is stable only in the case when we have these three layers in the tear film stable. And this tear break of time show us if the tear film has these three layers and it's stable, stable on the cornea. Do you understand me? Yes, thank you very much. Unfortunately, you're not here. This is not good for teaching and learning and medicine. You're not here to see this. Tests, unfortunately. Now, do you understand me? Yes, Professor, thank you. The most important is to have these three layers in right quantity and also in right quality. First layer was mucin, then aqueous layer, and then lipid layer. And only in this case, we have stable tear film on the eye not very fast evaporated. Okay? Also, one more question. In the yes. syllabus, it mentions a Mikulic syndrome. Mikulic syndrome? Yes. What exactly yes, this, is it? It's also dry, like Sugrain syndrome, like Mikulic, this is autoimmune disease. It's, other, it's affected other gland in the eyes, it's autoimmune disorders, or it's affect, and it's affected also with dry disease. We have more two lectures with you. I'm going to speak about the intraocular pressure and glaucoma. It's I think it will be on 12th of May or something like this, or 10th of May. I'm not sure. And then we're going to speak about also about the lens and the vitreal body. And if you have some questions to me about this lecture, you can ask me also next time when we meet. Of course, I can leave also my email and I will answer all of your questions. When we study, when you study at home, you don't understand something because I know that this is very difficult for you to stay home and to study medicine. Okay? Yes, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a good day. And we'll 
see you next time.